All right, hi everyone. I'm Josh Yvor. I'm from Ice Lake Partners. Hey. <laughs> and you are currently attending the BYOD Peep Show. Mobile devices bear off. Um, today we are going to be playing with the wireless here, um, specifically DEF CON Secure. It is not my fault that it's down right now. Um, I really truly have nothing to do with that, but that actually helps us. It makes it easier and it makes me not have to blast you with that thing. Um, so we'll let you know when that's actually going to happen. Um, it's completely voluntary. Um, we've made it so that it will likely only affect you guys. Um, but of course it's who knows what everyone else is doing with the wireless. So just a heads up, again, we'll make sure that you have full warning. Um, I do encourage you to participate because I know that the credentials that you use for the DEF CON secure Wi-Fi are, you know, not the same as your Gmail, um, at least I would hope. Um, so I hope you don't mind if I do capture those. So keep that in mind and uh, when the time comes it would be really nice if you'd turn your phones on. I'll let you know. All right, so over the past five years or so, a perfect storm has been brewing. This perfect storm has three components, much like the perfect storm of 91, which you see the NOAA weather graph from. So these three components started in 2008 with a single event at ShmooCon 2008 that we'll talk about. Then there is the growth of BYOD, and then a talk here last year at DEF CON um, that made everything really easy for what we're trying to do. So let's take a look at those. In 2008 at ShmooCon, uh, Joshua Wright and Brad and Tonowitz um, shared a talk that uh, basically outlined how PEEP was very commonly misconfigured. And at this time, this only really worked with uh, desktop operating systems. BYOD wasn't a thing yet. The iPhone was less than a year old. So this was not an, on anybody's radar that this would then eventually affect BYOD and mobile devices. So this research actually included a tool called Free Radius WPE. And that's been a standard for network penetration tests ever since. What, uh, what Josh and Brad found was that by default, um, the PEEP configurations that were in use on desktop operating systems did not do certificate validation. There are some other findings within the research, I encourage you to look at it, but that's the, the thing that we're going to leverage today. Because they didn't check the certificates, they had no way of knowing whether or not the authentication server they were talking to was a legitimate one or a rogue one. Okay. So the result from this research was that desktop systems were changed. There were upgrades and patches. Uh, there were security advisories that came out telling people how to actually configure things properly. And this has largely gone the way of the dinosaur as far as an issue. We still run across it once in a while, um, but typically it's, uh, it, it's largely mitigated at this time, at least in desktop operating systems. One of, the, uh, the th one of the lessons that came out of that research, at least at that time, was the notion that these, uh, a PEEP network can actually still be configured properly and be secure. And that's something that we're going to revisit today um, in the light of the other two parts of the storm. Then there's bring your own device. And I do have to apologize for how many times I'm going to say that buzzword. Um, but do know that when I say bring your own device, I'm not just talking about BYOD as it, it as like in its true um, definition, which is users actually bringing the devices that they own. This research and the tools and techniques we're going to talk about also works against mobile deployments within a corporation. So if your business buys you an Android device or an iPhone or a Blackberry, um, these attacks can still work against you. It's not just the devices that users bring that they personally own. So BYOD is huge. I don't think I need to talk too much about that. What's been really amazing is how fast it's grown um, in the past five years. So um, it's just, yeah, it's absolutely crazy. It's grown so fast that metrics that are reliable are really difficult to find. So the best I can give you is that anywhere between 60 and 85 percent of companies support BYOD in some shape or form. Whether or not that means, oh, hey, we give you an open Wi-Fi or we set up WPA2 Enterprise with PEEP, it's hard to tell um, and there are no real uh, hard numbers that we can give you. There's also the issue where we don't really know what the definition of BYOD is when we're trying to collect metrics. Um, because that definition changes between environments and based on who's actually collecting that, those metrics. What we can tell you is that in BYOD deployments that support WPA2 Enterprise, the vast majority of those deployments use PEEP for the authentication protocol. And we'll go in, into a little, little bit more detail as to why that is um, in a few minutes, um, but just know that by and large that is the most common WPA2 Enterprise authentication protocol, which is why it was the, uh, the juiciest target. And the third part of our storm, and the most recent, was uh, Moxie's research last year that was presented here at DEF CON, um, in, uh, in, at DEF CON 20. 
and uh, his associated product called Cloudcracker. So Cloudcracker, for those of you who um, might not have heard about this or weren't here last year, is a commercial service that's available now. Um, and through Moxie's research where he was able um, to, to reduce the strength of MSChap v2, um, challenge and response, responses, um, he was actually able to work with uh, some other guys to come up with some heavy duty uh, computing systems that are available online now that guarantee that they can crack a, uh, an MSChap v2 credential challenge and response in 24 hours or less for 100 bucks. And so if you think about the companies that tend to use BYOD deployments, um, th they tend to have a lot of users. That would be a network that I'd really like to get on. So 100 bucks is really not that much money when we're talking about a type of credential that will get me on a network. While we're talking about that credential, it's important to know that it's not just some random username or and password that that person is using just for logging on to the network. That's typically because of the way that these deployments work. Those are typically the AD creds your domain creds, the same creds that get you into the VPN, that get you into your email, and any other services that are, are managed through Active Directory or the equivalent. So this is a credential that we'd really like to have and that makes it much more likely that someone's going to be willing to spend the hundred bucks in order to get that. Also, don't forget that if it's a weak password, you can also crack it locally. All right. I'm going to spoil the rest of my talk here. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to tell you everything that we want you to walk away from with the, uh, from this talk. So on paper, PEEP should work. As long as everything is perfectly configured, PEEP should work. If all the devices validate the certificate, everything's going to be okay. But that doesn't actually happen in real world deployments. Even when you have a multi-million dollar company with a huge and really expensive and really fancy mobile, devi mobile device management system or MDM, those networks still have the same issue. And we know that because, because, we've, we've, because we've worked with or those organizations and we've found this issue. And so this isn't something that you can say just flat out that you know, it's, it's going to always be okay if you can figure everything properly. And we'll talk more about why that is a little bit later as well. The impact is absolutely staggering um, if you take a look at who could potentially be affected. The, the organizations that use BYOD are growing. The, num the, vast, the number of organizations that, are, that, are, that use BYOD are growing. And over the next few years, it's expected that we're going to get closer and closer to 80, 90 percent acceptance. And that means that by default, we're going to see the use of WPA2 Enterprise increase as security becomes um, more of a concern with mobile devices and as mobile devices need more access to internal network assets. And that's something that we're seeing with the development of more mobile, mobile applications that integrate with more what used to be traditionally only internal um, uh, or non-mobile internal assets and services. If you support one of these networks, first of all, I did come prepared. I have two uh, motion sickness bags for you if you need to come up and get one. Um, <laughs> So they're right here. Um, so the impact is, is enormous and there is no corrective action that's going to fix this really easily but we need to start working on it immediately. We'll have some ideas as we start to wrap up near the end here on what you can do to actually fix this issue if you are in the position of, yeah, needing one of those. The key thing that, that that damages the, the assertion that PEEP can work if it's configured properly is the fact that in a PEEP network, the users are in complete control. And that's because all I need to know is my username and password to get a mobile device on the network. And I don't know about you, but if I was running the wireless network for an organization that had 10, 20, 30,000 users, I'm not going to trust all of them to know how to configure the devices right. And even if I configure, configure their devices right for them and even hand it to them, nothing stops them from bringing on their own mobile device because they know how to connect because it's just their username and password. So here's the bottom line. Again, vomit bags up here. On defense, this is bad news. We'll go through some things that you can do to make this a little bit better. But it's going to take a while for this to be fixed um, and for these issues to, uh, to go away.
Fucking A, right, Lafroy. Now that is rocking. <laughs> What's this called? Shot the noob. Thank you very much. Why are we doing it? First time speaker. Who do we need on stage? Someone who's first time at DEF CON. All right, this guy over here. Thank you, yeah. Uh, so good question. There's only, some, only the second person who's asked that. So are the speaker goons doing a shot in every track for every new speaker? The answer is yes. <laughs> How many is that during this DEF CON? We have way freaking lost count. There is no chance we know that number. Think about it this way. It's Wait, we're almost ready. <laughs> it's okay. four to six an hour since 10 a.m. every day. Right. <laughs> we're here for you. Right. All right, to our new speaker and our new attendee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, if you happen to be on the other side of the fence, you should be really happy. And I know at DEF CON this is an appropriate crowd to share both of those images. Um, the barrier to entry to gain local access to a wireless network has been drastically lowered. And remote access to services that use the Active Directory domain or credentials that are exposed to the internet um, is also reduced. And you don't really need that much equipment to, to go out to do that. Now, there are some people who disagree, um, and this dates back to right after Moxie's talk last year. And some of the some of the things that you'll find, and there's lots of uh, follow-up after Moxie's talk last year, mainly about the VPN issue, but also about WPA2 Enterprise with PEEP. There's a lot of response um, from from uh, technical writers and people interested in security, and some of it is absolutely right but some of it um, I tend to disagree with it as well. So like I said earlier, it is completely true that a perfectly configured PEEP deployment is going to be just fine. But that never happens in reality. And so what we're going to see is that um, we're going to rely on the same people who did the same follow up last year after Moxie to hopefully help come up with better like deployment guides and configuration guides um, because we, tip we typically still see these issues um, in pen tests with mobile devices where some features that exist within mobile platforms aren't being used. Um, a good example that comes to mind is uh, iOS profiles that can be, that can be um, installed on phones and makes it really easy to deploy things, um, deploy configurations including WPA2 enterprise configurations. So that's one of the things that we're going to rely on the people who a year ago were saying this isn't a problem to then turn around and say hopefully, well, okay, this is a problem. Let's figure out some more solutions on how to fix it easier. So let's talk about some of the risks. Um, these are broad generalizations just to kind of give you a, a, a decent overview. Of course, it drastically differs in site to site and organization to organization. But typically we find that individual users the chances of you being targeted and the chances of you really caring that much if your work email is compromised, you know, at some point, especially if it's a device that your employer handed to you, you can fairly say, hey, that's not my problem. I didn't configure it. So the user experience varies. And in the type of attack that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, you'll, you'll kind of see why that is. Of course, there are certain attack methodolog methodologies you could use to try to target really high profile users. So let's say, for example, that you knew that a few, uh, few, few CEOs from a, a group of companies were going to be in a certain location. The attack that we're going to demonstrate and talk about um, shortly will be a lot easier and a lot more impactful. The smaller the organization, um, and I, I'm talking about smaller both in size and um, in, in IT resources, will also tend to have a, uh, um, excuse me, it is smaller in numbers of people, not resources. Smaller number of people will likely be, have lower risk. And that's primarily because you have fewer devices that you need to actually configure. If you're a mom and pop shop that uses WPA2 Enterprise um, with PEEP, um, well, first, kudos to you for configuring that on your own. Um, but you probably have your hands on every single one of those devices every day and probably make physical contact with every single person that carries one of those devices. So it's probably going to be pretty easy to manage. 
The twist to that though is that once you get into like small and medium sized like full grown businesses but they lack those IT resources to come up with a, a full fledged MDM solution, we see that they're much more likely to be vulnerable. If you have a user base that doesn't change very much, then you're going to have an easier time configuring and managing those devices regardless of your MDM solution or if you have one or not. Of course the higher risks are the, to the internal network at, um, assets that exist within the network that, th that can then be compromised with those credentials. Large organizations with more users of course have more users that are likely to have misconfigurations. And I'll share some metrics um, from my testing experience a little bit later. And of course the more phones and devices you have coming in and out the more likely you are to, to make mistakes. And this misconfiguration is everywhere. And one of the things I wanted to point out is a public example that we can share. I'm not going to call out any individual universities or public education institutions um, but you can do that yourself. It's really easy. Um, because those types of organizations have to support so many users and their IT help desk staff is t uh, typically just swamped regardless of trying to manage WPA2 enterprise, they tend to put all of their instructions for accessing the, uh, the wireless network online which private companies tend not to do. But if you can see their wikis, like if you guys go back to your employer and you want to check to see what the likelihood of your organization being vulnerable to this type of attack is, then check your internal wiki or documentation that tells you how to configure your mobile devices if you have a BYOD policy at your, at your employer. And that, that will tell you uh, pretty quickly whether or not uh, you're going to have an issue. And we'll show you what that looks like. So this is taken from one of the universities in that search result. And typically what we find is that the instructions are super old. Really old versions of Android, Blackberry, um, the Windows phone before is Windows phone, Windows mobile is on there too often. Um, and what we see as well is that either the user is explicitly told not to install a certificate or they don't say anything about the certificate and just put up a screenshot like this. And so that's the configuration that I need, that's the configuration that I'm going to go with. And we still even see that for Windows as well. Where even today, even after Brad and Josh's talk in 2008, we still see publicly available information from the authority for a network telling users not to validate the certificate. You see that in the other settings comment at the bottom there. So that's pretty scary. So we have a lot of catching up to do even from 2008. But now we have to catch up even faster because BYOD is growing so much. So why peep? Well, this, this shows a little bit of it. Um, so PEEP and EPTLS, EPTLS by the way um, requiring mutual certificate authentication. So a, the, auth the authentication server presents a certificate and then the user validates that, hopefully, and then sends it their own certificate back. So it's not actually using AD creds. Um, EPTLS and PEEP are the two most, most, support, most widely supported, um, excuse me, most widely supported EEP types across mobile device platforms and in general as well for desktop operating systems. It used to be that the Wi-Fi Alliance required support for EPTLS if you're going to be WPA2 Enterprise certified. That's no longer true. I think that changed back in like 2005 or 2006. Um, I wasn't quite I wasn't quite able to get an exact date on that. But but what you see is that PEEP is the most widely supported across mobile devices. And so if your goal is to just support as many devices as you can, truly be a BYOD organization, then PEEP is a very attractive option. It's also much easier to configure. Because I don't know about you but um, I know that like my mom doesn't know how to actually download and install a client certificate. I mean it's really, it's hard enough trying to tell her how to find a PDF that she downloaded on her mobile operating system. That can be pretty tricky. And then trying, trying to actually go ahead and uh, manage a certificate and then get that on the device securely. Especially for, especially for device, uh, device platforms that don't support MDM solutions or that are, that don't have a, uh, a robust integration with them, that can be troublesome. There are many other EEP types but uh, the ones that you see on the screen are the ones that are supported by those devices or not. So really quick um, just for a few people who might not be really familiar with WPA2 Enterprise and the difference between why we use that versus a pre-shared key like with WPA2 or open, we'll just talk about this briefly. So it's all about access control granularity. In an open network it's open, we get that. 
With WPA2, you just need one shared key, the passphrase. And everybody knows it. And that's great for like your, your family network and what you go home to. But as an organization grows and you get like 100, 200, thousands of users, it gets pretty, uh, pretty bulky and cumbersome. Because what ends up happening is, unlike WPA2 Enterprise, where each individual user has a username and password or some other credential that it associates that device to that user, when we actually have a compromise of those credentials, or let's say it's not even a compromise but somebody leaves an organization and we don't want them to know the password, it becomes an issue. Because in WPA2, what you have to do is actually change the password of the Wi-Fi network and then change that setting on every single one of your wireless devices. And that does not scale well. And that's why WPA2 Enterprise is used so widely in large organizations. Because at that point, all you have to do is lock a single account and you're good. So let's talk about where these issues actually lie. And this will build, kind of build up the, the path to talking about the actual um, exploitation methods. And uh, we'll get into that, those fun details. So 802.11 is pretty straightforward as far as associa association to the access point. What's interesting here is that there's a request for the AD username, the request for the identity. The Id identity is then given back. That's actually outside of um, directly speaking to the uh, radius server um, as far as uh, establishing a secure tunnel. So regardless of whether or not you have a, uh, a rogue or real access point, or access point uh, displaying a uh, rogue um, or real radius server, you can still get the username of the person that's, uh, that's trying to connect their device. That's something that we've known for a really long time. It's just fun to know. So outer authentication, and this is what was broken by Brad and Josh with free radius WPE. So that identity goes to the radius server. The radius server then sends back a certificate. The client is supposed to validate that certificate. But in order to do that, it has to have either that certificate pinned already, or it has to have a trusted root um, for the CA identified. And we'll get more into that later. But that establishes the, the, the secure tunnel. And then inside of that secure tunnel is where Moxie comes in. So now that that secure tunnel has been established, there's an access challenge that comes from the radius server to the mobile device. And then a challenge response that goes back from the mobile device to the radius server. That's the part where if you can get a mobile device to connect to you, even with an invalid certificate, the fact that you can capture those challenging responses means that you can then reverse that using Moxie's tools and research. We're going to get into the mobile platforms and talk about how they differ because what's really interesting um, in doing this research and, uh, and, and the live testing with organizations is that none of the mobile device platforms are perfect. Some are better in some areas, some are worse in some areas. It's just a really diverse um, set of support and features for WPA2 Enterprise. One thing I want to note here is that just remember that I'm not saying that one platform is more secure than the other overall. We're specifically just talking about WPA2 Enterprise. We're going to take a look at the four major, I guess, mobile platforms. We're going to take a look at Android, Blackberry, iOS, and Windows Phone 8. So for Android, Android has the largest user base just in the general population worldwide. What's difficult to find metrics on is in organizations that support BYOD is how many users are using Android versus iOS. That da data is not readily available at this time. Um, but from the, the experience that I've had doing tests at, at different environments, um, iOS and Android from the, the organizations I've worked with are probably about 50, 50, 60, 40, somewhere in there. So Android supports the types that you see up there. What's interesting about the user interface for configuring WPA2 Enterprise is that it's reused between EPTLS and EPPEEP and all the other EAP types. And so that made it really easy for the developers and to some extent to the users because nothing is going to move around. But people actually tend to start to ignore the certificate configuration part um, if they don't, if they're not explicitly told what they need to do with it. So you can see that I'm configuring my device here, following the instructions that we found on the college's website. By default, if I click on the CA certificate, there's nothing available to me, available to me. And that's both good and bad. It's good because public CAs can be used 
But there are some drawbacks to using public CAs for authenticating um, the Radius server. The reason that that can be a challenge is because mobile devices don't actually validate the CN name and of the certificate. And so let's say that, um, let's say that you use Trustwave um, for your, uh, or VeriSign for your, your certificate. That means that all of your mobile devices are going to have that root CA as the trusted CA for your wireless network. All I really need then is a certificate from one of those public CAs and they're public. So I'm going to spend 100 bucks, 150 bucks, something like that and then I can then potentially get your devices to connect to me and I will pass that validation. So it's good and it's bad. This prevents you from selecting a whole bunch of different public CAs by default. Um, but it also doesn't prompt you or anything to, to communicate with the radius server and actually see what the uh, certificate is or to, or to install one um, that is available externally. Inside of the phase two authentication you actually see that there's uh, a whole bunch of different options there as well. Um, that also leads to some misconfigurations that are outside the scope of what we're talking about here. But uh, let's just say that when you're doing testing and Android devices are misconfigured you can see some really silly things coming over the network. On to iOS. iOS um, has a relatively well, a very strong business presence. Um, part of that from the feedback I've received comes from their, their configurability especially with those iOS profiles that, that can be pushed out to the devices. The peep configuration is really straightforward. You enter your username and password. It actually prompts you to validate the certificate. It's a trust on first use approach. So the user is actually shown a certificate. It says not verified if it's not in one of the installed CAs within the operating system. And before you accept it, you can actually take a look at the details. And this way you can see whether it's the default certs that come with free rate of WPE or if it's actually the certificate that you're expecting from your organization. Now users really are terrible at figuring that out but oftentimes if the organization says example inc and you're expecting that it's going to be your business's certificate, hopefully that's going to raise a flag. Blackberry. And I do apologize for the uh, screenshots. It's not easy to get a, uh, a screen capture out of, um, out of an old Blackberry. So Blackberry actually has a lot of different EAP types that they support. They have the most of any of the mobile platforms. Not all EAP types are created equal though and only a handful of them remain secure. And that, uh, if you want more information on that, um, Josh and Brad's research goes into a lot of the details there. So this is both good and bad. All the, there's wide, wide support on the platform for just about every type, every EAP type that you can find in a uh, mobile environment. Um, but again, some of those are not that great to use. The peep configuration is nice in that if you see the blue bar at the bottom, you actually have to explicitly disable certificate validation if that's what you want it to do. By default, BlackBerry requires you to validate the certificate. You can't complete that configuration until you've either disabled it or given it a, given it a CA. But this one, BlackBerry, has all the public CAs available. Again, it's both good and bad. It depends on, it depends on your risk profile and things like that. Windows Phone 8 doesn't have a very large business present presence right now, but it have, seeing that it comes from such a, uh, a well-known vendor and manufacturer, um, it's something that is worth talking about. The peep configuration is similar to iOS um, at the start where it's just a very simple user interface, username and password. But you'll notice that the validate server, certi validate server certificate option is at the very bottom um, and it's off by default. And so that's something that makes it pretty easy to accidentally just click through without installing the certificate. In fact, you don't even see a certificate prompt or a place where you can actually enter a certificate until you turn that on. The certificates that are available on Windows Phone 8 are actually kind of interesting. Um, there's a very small number, which is good because the fewer CAs that you trust, the better. But they actually, and this has nothing to do with um, the security of the, the platform, but I did find it interesting that there are actually two expired certificates that, are, that it ships with. It was just odd, a, a strange finding. All right, so you understand now the different platform support for WPA2 Enterprise. You see that PEEP is the most widely supported. And, oh, yeah, just want to uh, mention again that you saw on the table that Windows Phone 8 only supports PEEP, not TLS, no other. Um, 
no other EAP types. So now that we've gone through all the different mobile platforms and you understand that it that the user experience varies and that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to write instructions for your users to follow like if you're if you're a university or a large organization for example so the chances for misconfiguration are pretty high let's take a look at how we attack then is that's the fun part when i'm telling you about these things in the traditional network attacks here um, we're going we're gonna to be using some anonymized data about uh, some real life attacks that we're able to do. As we get into the, uh, the more exotic and fun attacks, um, there will be some hypothesized things um, based on some other fun stuff. So in a traditional attack, it's a regular rogue access point. All you need is a laptop really. In my setup up here, um, we'll talk about that later, but I'm actually using some, a, a regular router and uh, um, another Wi-Fi card and antenna. Um, that's mainly because I expected a lot more pushback from, uh, from the audience and the hostility of the uh, wireless network here. Um, but it turns out we might not actually, might, might not actually run into any problems there. So with, with a, what's that? Not since you said that. Not since I said that. Yeah, I see all the laptops coming on. Um, actually that would be good for me. I'd really like that right now. <laughs> actually in about a few more minutes. So you know, the traditional attack, it's just like uh, trying to capture somebody on an open Wi-Fi network with a, a, a pineapple or something like that. Um, the best way to, to perform one of these attacks is to broadcast as an access point connected to a radius server. The de facto standard is free radius WP right now, um, although we'll talk about more tools that, that can actually do that as well. I'll, I'll broadcast the, the SSID, the network name of company X, and the best way to do this attack is actually not to be on site at company X. What you want to do is go to some place where you're going to find their, find their employees and users but away from their wireless networks. And that's for multiple reasons. First, it makes it a lot easier to actually get them to associate with you. Because then you're not fighting the, the broadcast and the, the power of the, the other, like the, the real access points. You, sure, you can de off, but then that makes, it, that makes it a lot more of a headache. Additionally, testing away from buildings and away from the real network reduces the likelihood that you're going to be caught. A lot of wireless systems now actually come with features where you can triangulate the location of rogue access points. And so if you're camped out in a parking lot and you're a little too close, there's a good chance that physical security might come knocking on your door. I can tell you from experience though that having your daughter in the back seat holding the router makes it a lot less likely that anyone from physical security is going to mess with you. <laughs> so, uh, story time. So an example that I can tell you about is an organization with about 1,500 users. They didn't have their own builder, building or anything like that. They were on a, a multi-level building on one of the floors. Their access points were, were weak enough where you couldn't really get reception outside of the building though. So a great way to perform an attack like this is actually to sit out if there's like a park or a lobby out front. If you can find any choke point, an entryway, an exit, that's great. I was able to sit down in the lobby and actually get everyone on their way in and out as they're going to the elevator or the stairs. And so that, that was pretty easy. There's one single cho choke point. Now that type of organization would be pretty difficult to target out in the, in the general population. I'm saying that because I'm going to lead up to some of the more fanciful attacks um, that are coming next. When you have a much larger organization though, for about a thousand people or more, you know, some of the organizations that, that come to mind can even be in the tens and maybe even hundreds of thousands of, of people, you're much more likely to run across those users other places, just out in the general public. For, the, for organizations that have their own campus, one of the best ways to pull off this attack is actually to sit at the edge of the parking lot, especially if there is like a major freeway there or a stoplight or anything like that where they're queuing up to actually come into the parking lot. One of my favorite experiences was doing a test like this on the edge of a, uh, on the edge of a, a campus and there, were, there was a, a lot of people that, that rode their bicycles to work. And as I'm sitting there monitoring the tools and you actually see who's trying to access uh, your, your, your access point and talk to the radio server and you just all of a sudden see all this traffic go by and then it drops off as they ride by. And so that was pretty fun. Um, so finding a choke point and a physical presence is great. Now these traditional attacks are well known, they're well established, everyone, everyone can do this. The trouble is what if you're not there? What if you want to be able to compromise somebody's Active Directory creds from their mobile devices and you can't get access to where they actually work. 
Well, you have to go find them somewhere else. And that's where the, uh, the more interesting attacks come up. So for multiple networks, what if I didn't just want to get into my bank's network? What if I wanted to get into any or all banks' networks? Can't do that traditional attack. I mean, I could, but I'd have to sit in one place, broadcast one network name, one SSID for a long time, wait, stop, do it again. It's going to take a long time. So, what if we did something like create a tool that would actually let us rotate the SSIDs on a predetermined basis? What that would let us do is actually hop in the car and do like we're driving 3.0, which is where you're not actually targeting access points. You are the access point and you're targeting mobile device users. So I'm going to use San Francisco, which is where our headquarters is, as an example. So if I wanted to target banks, what I would do is hop in my car with my list of SSIDs matched to a whole bunch of banks or any other organization that would be around there. And all I have to do is drive around the financial district at lunchtime. Chances are I'm going to find a bunch of people who are out to lunch, away from their organization, away from their Wi-Fi networks, and that, that means it's going to be very easy for them to connect to my access point. And the only catch is that we have to make sure that we're rotating SSID frequently enough in order to uh, make it effective. So if you think about that, you can actually curate this list by industry or even by geographical location. In that example we did both. You can get some really awesome extra credit if you do it on public transit as well. Public transit is fantastic, especially in the Bay Area because you have a lot of t uh, tech companies that use uh, services like BART and Caltrain. So public, uh, pu public transportation services uh, can be a really good hunting area. And then finally, what if we just don't care? I just want to get on some network, I want AD creds, I just think it's fun. Well, we can do that too. That just means that instead of having a predetermined curated list, it means that we're going to dynamically change the list. And we can do that by listening for probe requests, for beacons, and also by going a little bit further and using some uh, outside tools. So let's talk about that. The existing tools that we have, Free Radius WP, which you heard me talk about, um, that's just a radius server that's been modified to, to uh, shoot out the MSCHAP v2 uh, challenge and response instead of keeping it secret. Um, that's pretty fun. There's host APD and host APD WPE. Um, Brad actually did uh, host APD WPE for um, testing uh, EAP fast, which you should probably look into if you want to support that. There's also DDWirt and OpenWirt, which you can easily script. Um, and one of the things that I haven't done yet, but I'd really like to look at, is patching the free radius um, tool that's available for OpenWirt with free radius WP. That would be pretty cool, because you could just have a standalone low power router that you just drop somewhere and let it go. So the goal of this tool is just to give every single network peep. Just give it to everyone. So what's next for that tool? Well, you can script the rotation of SSIDs in DDWirt and OpenWirt. And that can, can get kind of cumbersome and, and, uh, and annoying because you have to listen for them, you have to build the list, and then you have to get them onto the, the Wirt somehow. Now you can probably do that within the Wirt. I haven't got that far yet. There's a tool called uh, Host APD Python Script, which allows you to control Host APD from within Python, which also means that you can use Scappy to listen for all those probes and the beacons and then dynamically add those to your list. Hmm? Host APD Karma as well? All right, that's fantastic. That just made things easier. So Host APD Karma. All right, so getting fancy, what else could we do? We could use GPS, potentially. Haven't done that yet, but if you can give it coordinates and you can query a resource, saying, hey, I want every WPA2 enterprise SSID within 10 miles of where I am. You can go anywhere in the world and potentially exploit a whole bunch of networks that you don't even know exist. And then you can just do the research and figure out where they are and what networks you got into. So the goal is eventually to get this into a single tool. Um, my colleague Ryan Lacey and I have been working on this for a little bit. It's difficult. It's not easy, easy at all. There's a group called, uh, there's um, a tool called EAPeak 
that was presented at one of the Black Hats in 2011, I believe, that got pretty far along that path, um, but I think that they took a different approach later on. But uh, it's not easy, but we're, we're getting there. Hopefully eventually we'll be able to re release a full single tool that will actually do all this in one, one install. Um, we're not quite there yet. We uh, will be sharing some of the, uh, the tools that we've used to build up to that, including the logic that we've been using to, uh, to build those dynamic uh, SSIDs. So how do we fix this? You can't just turn off your internet. And I bring that up because, well, it actually happened here, um, which reminds me of a place that we did this at once. Um, we were working with an organization where there was a PEEP network. And after working with them, realized, hey, we can't support this. Rolled out an EEP TLS network, but with a different name. And you can probably see where the problem is. Because you can exploit this even without the network. So five, six months later, you can go back, potentially, and broadcast as that old network name if you happen to know it and still communicate with the devices. And if they don't rotate their credentials regularly and if they don't have high um, device turnover, there's a really good chance that you're still going to find somebody who's misconfigured. Even though the network doesn't exist, which is kind of creepy. So really, EEP TLS, it's difficult to support um, and difficult to roll out, but it leads to more security. Um, we also need better mobile device management. So, quick comparison. EEP TLS is nearly universal as is PEEP. The difference is, is that PEEP is easy, EEP is hard, or EEP TLS is hard. Let's take a look at why. I'm running out of time and I want to get to the demo. So, doing PEEP right takes a lot of work. We talked about a perfect storm. To do PEEP right, you have to do so much work that hopefully, and this is what I hope you experience for those of you who are on the defensive side of this, in order to do PEEP right, you have to do so much work that it's probably going to still be easier to deploy EEP TLS. Because in the end, remember, even if you perfectly configure your network, that one user or ten users that want to add their own device still know their username and password. And your MDM solution isn't going to touch that, especially if they misconfigure it so badly that they don't even bring it to work anymore and it's just sitting in their car and you can still pick it up while you're war driving 3.0 all the way around. So DEF CON secure. I'm hoping some of you didn't install a certificate. Um, those of you using iOS uh, probably are going to be more okay. Um, right now we're going to go ahead and get into the uh, demo. We have four minutes for that. Last warning. I'm asking all of you to be victims. This is not going to hurt, I promise. <laughs> I, you, I will not crack your passwords. Um, I don't really think your DEF CON secure password is worth 100 bucks or the time and energy it would take for me to do it on my own. Um, no man in the middle is going to be conducted. So like I don't have, I'm not connected to the internet here. So I can't even provide you a service even if I wanted to. So you're going to be all set there. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. So last chance, if you don't want to participate, please turn your phones off, mobile devices, hit your Wi-Fi switch on your laptop. But otherwise, please, it's the end of DEF CON and this would be kind of fun if I got like 40 of you. Um, so turn your phones on, please, and participate. And let's go ahead and get into that. By the way, that's everyone, that's everyone probing for uh, DEF CON secure right now. So this might actually work. And I was going to need a deauth, but I don't think I need to anymore. Now we gotta make sure that I'm actually on the right IP address. Yep, should be. Is anyone picking up uh, DEF CON secure now? No? Okay, it might take a second here. I gotta turn my wife back on. Okay, it's still booting up. Okay. Should be coming up. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Some of you are hitting it. 
All right, now, let's see if I can show you, not there yet. So one of the problems is that even if you don't, even if you do validate the certificate, you still talk to this and so a lot of you are talking to it and this little thing is falling apart. <laughs> but I do have a backup example I can show you. I'm connecting. All right, I just saw my name go by. Oops, sorry. All right, so on the screen what you see is the output every time somebody's trying to connect to me. And when you see the big TLS blobs go by, that's when I get happy. Really? That's awesome. That's a good name. You guys are validating your certificates. Oh, a black hat? No. No, that was not me at black hat. <laughs> well, that's uh, disappointing. What's that? Yes, I'm in the right directory. Thanks, though. <laughs> Uh, no, um, other way. At least in my experience, I've had it so that uh, when the log is there, it actually won't update the current log. All right, well, I'm running out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this on for another couple seconds, maybe a minute or two, and hopefully get some more. Um, we see all the EAP traffic going by, and I can tell you, like, the name that we saw. Oh, wow, somebody had strong feelings about Black Hat. Um, so, what I can tell you is that I see like my name coming by and the eat blobs. When you saw that big blob there, that's the cert and that's the challenge and that's the eat message going back and forth. We're getting it, it's just not logging. So there's too many of you. All right. So I got to wrap up, but thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs>